All right, I was just showing you how to find some things on Pixabay. And this was a resource. And I'm going to use the largest pixel dimension one. And then I'm going to say download. And it's going to go to our downloads folder, which is the one next to your trash can. Right? And sometimes there'll be PNGs. Oops. And sometimes there'll be JPEGs. We'll learn the difference, but they both work for this project. So the screen grabs will always go right to your desktop, and then most things you download from the internet will go to your downloads folder, which is kind of our junk drawer. Now, what if we just go to Google and I type in Tuxedo Cat? It will correct me and say, well, actually, you mean a bicolor cat. But if I click on images, you know, I can get to a Google image search. Now, this is not Creative Commons. This is largely copyrighted and, and largely commercial. But you'll notice under your image searches, you'll have a tools box. Click on that tools box, and just like Pixabay, you can limit the size. If you say large, it will only be image files that are 1,000 pixels or more at each dimension, some significantly more. But it does not mean they are high quality. This is not curated content like Pixabay. So sometimes you get really, really messed up images here that say they're big but really look terrible. Next, I can change the color, and I want just black line art. So I'm going to say black and white. Then I can say type, and I can actually say line drawing. So that's pretty helpful. And then if I'm feeling optimistic, I can say usage rights. And I can say only Creative Commons licenses. But this does not mean that they are Creative Commons open. This means any Creative Commons license, which is why this is a minefield. <laughs> um, because these are not always correct tags, right? So this is not legal backing. You can't say, well, I found it on a Google search and it said Creative Commons. Because you don't know if that requires you to give attribution or that requires you not to profit from it you'd have to do a lot more research on the image. So instead, I usually just leave that one as all. Okay? So now if I scroll through this, I'm looking for things I can use and cut out, and I'm looking for some variety. So let me see. This one's pretty funky and interesting. I like that. And I can see that it's a 1,000 pixels in one dimension, but it's less than a 1,000 in the other. And maybe I can get away with that. So what would I do? I would right-click it, and I would say Open Image in New Tab. And that way I could see the quality of the image. And already it doesn't look good. And if I zoom in, I can see that there's really bad distortion on it. So this is an example of what you see all the time from Google Images. This image was a much smaller resolution. And then the user that put it online forced it to be bigger than it was originally. And so what you get is distortions that happen. Like basically around every original pixel they did a little airbrush of gray pixels <laughs> to make it bigger. And so this is bad image quality. We do not want to use this. And you can see that that distortion in the black as well. So no matter how much we like it, this is not good enough quality to use for our purposes. So this is kind of the headache of using Google Images, right? This one is large enough. It's 1,500 by 1,600. So I'm going to right click and say Open Image in New Tab. And then I zoom in and I see, yeah, it actually looks pretty good. It's not clean line art. It's actually a sketched line. But I can make that work for this project if I needed to. On and on, right? So you just have to do a lot more kind of careful searching. Because remember, all these sites want to sell you something. So they don't like to give you a good asset for free. So if I open image in a new tab, it looks like it's big enough. It's 2,000 by 2,000. I zoom in on it. That looks great. But look closely. Actually, you can't see it on your projector. But there are watermarks on it. So it says free pick, ironically, at an angle in dark gray everywhere there's black. Now, I, I actually can use that. Just like I can change the color from blue to black, I can change this to solid black. But 
we'll learn to kind of scrutinize our image resources, right? This is image mining, and it's not like you get diamonds fully formed and perfect right out of the earth. Sometimes you have to work with them a little bit. I'm trying to find good raw materials. So what do I have? I have four so far. One, two, three, four. One from Pixabay, one from Google Images, two from AutoDraw. I would say you want about seven. We need a minimum of five, but it's always good to have extras. So you can be picky. And I tend to use ones that don't have things that are cropped off. You know, just like a coloring book page, I like to have it all contained. Kind of free floating, but that's just me. This could be interesting. Now, Redbubble, this is a thousand by a thousand pixels. This is someone who makes money by selling their original artwork. And here I am showing how to steal it, right? But if I open that image in a new tab, let's see how good a job Redbubble does protecting the work. Doesn't do a great job. It's all there for me to use. So what does that mean? Since I know this is copyrighted, just assume everything on Google image search is copyrighted. If I use it without changing it enough to legally defend it as transformed work, then it's con considered derivative work. And if it's derivative work, then I am not only liable for, for any money I make as being damages to the original creator, I'm also liable to their hurting their brand, right? So one example I, I use, this is from my childhood, Calvin and Hobbes, uh, peeing. This is a sticker that's everywhere. This is not something that Bill Watterson, the creator of Calvin and Hobbes, ever, ever drew or ever licensed. He would have made millions of dollars if he did. What's nice about Bill Watterson is he thought the whole copyright system was very broken and he never, he never litigated anyone. Right? So that's why you saw these, these stickers everywhere on the back of cars. And you would have Calvin pee on the thing you don't like, right? But he very easily could have litigated and won. And he could have taken all the money that was earned from these stickers. But much more than that, he could have sued for a violation of his family-friendly brand, right? And Bill Watterson, who created Calvin and Hobbes, made millions and millions of dollars syndicating those cartoons. So his lawsuit might be for the sticker manufacturer, you owe me $17,000 in sales for those stickers because that was in discovery of the case. But you owe me $20 million because you've damaged my brand. And it's pretty indefensible, right? To say, well, I changed it 20%. No, you added liberals to it. <laughs> you know, it, it isn't changed at all, so it's completely derivative. So for... For class purposes, for educational purposes, under fair use, you can use copyrighted material. And if you don't fully transform it, that's OK. But if you try to sell it on Redbubble, or you try to uh, pass it off as your own work outside of an educational context, you want to be able to defend it. So I'm going to show you how we can do that. So I want to make this work indistinguishable not indistinguishable, that's the wrong word. I want to make it unrecognizable by the original person who made it by the time I'm finished. So what do I mean? Because this is a weird idea. But art always is inspired by other art, right? And one of my favorite artists is Arturo Herrera, who I believe started work in Colombia, his, his home country. And I first saw an exhibit of his where, where these two works appeared. Uh, this one is like a wall hanging cut out uh, that are very, very large. And what I love about the work is it's really obvious that he takes the line art directly from a Disney property of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which is still under copyright. It will actually lapse pretty soon, which is why they're releasing their live action version. So they can renew their, top cop their copyright. But um, he's avoided getting sued by Disney, which is famously the most litigious company on the planet for copyright law, and is known to, to write, have lobbyists that write the copyright laws for our country. The last copyright major change was 1997, and it was called the Disney Law. And the, we'll talk more about copyright later. You have reading about it. But 
basically, this is copyrighted material, no doubt. So what he is doing in a way that he feels is defensible and a way that Disney lawyers feel is defensible, which is why they haven't brought suit against him, is that he is transforming the content of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves into his own original composition. Here he does it just, he actually literally did this with coloring books and then created a big piece from that um, with lines from the original characters, but avoiding all the heads, avoiding all the faces, avoiding things that are like marketable materials and joining them all together so they feel like they're this, you know, free form drawing. And then here, just taking one drawing of Snow White, but then more than half of it is completely replaced with different line art, which is like dripping abstract expressionism, right? Which connects to the original lines. And then I include this because this is some from some uh, from some past students that went on to form their own graphic design firm called Primates Design, and then also have a, a film company in San Antonio called Wally Films. And this is a band that they promote, and this is their design, and it just it uses used line art jumbles, right, to promote this band, which is a two-member band, but they did little line art drawings of the band members and then just layered them on top of each other, so it looks like there's more people in the band. So this skill, as simple as it is, can be used professionally. So if we download that stuff, let's see, I've got one, two, three, four, five. Now what do we do? I'm going to get one more by Pixabay. Let's see. I'm just going to look up Black Cat. And again, I want to limit it. I want it to be only illustrations. I want it to be black and white. And remember, if it's on Pixabay, then all of them are big enough. The trick is I don't want solid black, even though that is bitmap, you know, that's going to cover up all the other lines I use. And I could do something clever, but that's going to confuse you a little bit. Like I could do white lines on top of a black shape, but that's not, not what I'm in it to do right now. Oh, that, that one's pretty interesting. A scruffy aspect of line art. Because sometimes line art can look like it has shading in it, even though it doesn't. So I'm going to download that one. It goes to my downloads folder. I'm going to drag it out to the desktop. So as we do this, I want you to think of your desktop. And remember, the shortcut for getting to it is function F11. Think of this as your drawing table at home. And if this is a traditional collage, you would be cutting this line art out of different sources and then just littering your table with it, right? Then when you're ready to put it together into the final composition, you would get out a nice clean piece of art paper. You would tape it down to the middle of your desk. That's what we're going to do in a program called Photopea, right? And we can do the same thing in, a, in the Adobe program Photoshop. So let's go to the directions. And you'll see, once you've found your images and you have at least five of them, we're going to go to this site. Photopea is a public website. You can access it from anywhere. You can create an account with it, but I wouldn't trust it. So I just don't tend to log in. You can donate to it if you want, <laughs> you know, but you don't have to. It is freeware. And what is wonderful about it is it supports creative cloud formats, especially it supports Photoshop formats, which are PSDs. So we are in Photopea. We want to click on New Project. And in Photoshop, we would just say New File. We don't want to use any templates ever. No to templates in this class. You'll, have to, you'll be forced to use templates for much of your life. So not right now. So let's give it a name. Because we're a studio, you always need to have something in all of your file names. And that is your name, <laughs> right? So if it gets lost in the computer, we can find it. So I always want you to start with your name. You can just use your first name. And then I want you to do a dash and then a description of it. I don't want you to use any symbols other than a dash because sometimes those aren't supported by what you need them to be. So I'm going to say Carl and I'm going to say exercise one dash one dash free. So as long as you have your name, you can describe this like you want. But I don't want to say create yet 
because I need to set up the parameters of the of the artboard. So first of all, we want 